Welcome to our webinar on matters of leave and accommodation. This is the second in a series of webinars that the Labor and Employment and Human Resources Practice Group at the Wagner Law Group will be offering. This presentation will last approximately 30 minutes, and the slides from the webinar will be available on the Wagner Law Group website. Let me introduce David Gabor of Council with the Wagner Law Group. David is a recognized leader in the employment law field. He represents clients in litigation, the negotiation and drafting of contracts, handling compliance issues, the creation of corporate infrastructure, the drafting of policies, training of employees, and leading companies towards organizational excellence. Welcome, David. Thank you, Barbara. Um, good day. I think that we have all had times when we want to be noticed or selected win the lottery, win a raffle, win tickets to a ball game, a concert, or a show. And then again, there are times that we do not want to be noticed. Does anybody here want to be the proud recipient of a summons and complaint as a defendant in an employment discrimination case accusing you of breaking serious federal laws? Imagine having to take that back to your superiors in the company. So there are those instances where we do not want to be noticed. This program is about leave laws and accommodations. Employers have a strong need for continuity, productivity, employee engagement. That's necessary for companies to succeed. At the same time, the government has a strong interest in getting employees back to work in keeping unemployment rates down, in having employees whenever and wherever possible working on a full-time basis. So the employers, and this includes executives, human resources, managers, and supervisors, need to know how to handle requests for leave and requests for reasonable accommodations. So let's work together to find out what can work in your organization. The goal is to provide a seamless and a well-run program that meets the needs of your organization and is not unduly burdensome and adheres to the laws. In order to achieve these goals, companies need to be prepared prior to when an employee makes a request for a leave or makes a request for an accommodation. And this means that the managers and the supervisors need to be working together along with the executives. By having a coordinated approach, we can reduce legal exposure. During this webinar, we will review some recent cases that have been brought by the EEOC and by private employees in court, and we can talk about the pitfalls in those cases and how we can avoid them. Prior to talking about the cases, I think it's helpful to talk about some terms. The first one is leave. No, I'm not talking about a leave of your senses or leaving on a jet plane. When an employee takes time off for a leave or requests time off, it might be for a personal matter. It could be medical. It could be involving a family member who has some sort of a need. It could be because the employee was injured. It could be for workers' compensation. To vote, yes, November is coming up, for jury duty. For military leave, whether active duty or a reserve, those are some of the examples of times when employees ask for leave. A reasonable accommodation, that is an effort by the company and the employee to find a way for an employee to be able to continue to work either on a full-time or perhaps on a part-time basis with some sort of an accommodation by the employer to enable that employee to function on the job. A key in reasonable accommodation is flexibility, but it also does not mean an absolute. Every time an employee asks for an accommodation, it does not mean it has to be granted. Retaliation, the R word, and this one is so very important. Retaliation is about timing. There is an action 
by an employee who is a member of some sort of a protected class. There is a reaction by the employer that the employee perceives to be adverse. There is typically close temporal proximity between the action and the reaction. In leave and accommodation cases, the action could be a request for an accommodation, a request for leave, going out on workers' compensation or filing on workers' compensation, requesting family medical leave, asking for time off for jury duty. Please note that the employee does not have to be right that, a, that the employee's rights were violated. It's enough if the employee reasonably believes a right has been violated in order for the employee to have a chance to prevail in court on a claim for retaliation. Disparate treatment is going to come up a lot today. That, and the best example of that would be there are five employees who have requested the same type of leave or accommodation. Four of the five are male, and the company grants all four of their requests. The female also makes a request, but the company denies her request. She may bring a claim of disparate treatment, and that's an example where a Title VII case could also be involved with an ADA or an FMLA case. The Americans with Disabilities Act has a shift in focus in the last couple of years. It has gone away from an employee having to prove a disability that's covered by the ADA and towards a presumption that the disability is covered and now the focus is on getting that employee back to work as soon as possible, whenever and wherever possible. The Family Medical Leave Act applies to employees in companies that are covered companies who have been with the company for one year or more on a full-time basis. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is the federal agency responsible for enforcing federal employment laws. The EEOC, as part of its mission, loves publicity. And one of the things they do is they love, whenever possible, to promote the cases they file and the outcomes of their cases through, among other things, issuing press releases. And once again, this is one we prefer to be invisible. We do not want to be the subject of an EEOC press release. No good will come of that. Just ask Verizon and SuperValue. Verizon was charged by the EEOC with violating employees' rights under the disability laws by failing and refusing to grant reasonable accommodations. Basically, Verizon had a policy that there was no exceptions under an attendance policy that would merely count the number of absences, and when an employee reached a certain threshold, they were disciplined. It would be a step one, a step two, ultimately termination of employment. And Verizon did not make exceptions in situations when an employee was out of work due to a disability. And by refusing to grant those exceptions, the EEOC felt that the company had violated its obligations under the ADA. Verizon had to pay, yes, you, you see it correctly, $20 million. Verizon had to revise its employment policies and attendance plans to provide for reasonable accommodations. Verizon had to excuse certain absences, and Verizon had to provide periodic ADA training to supervisors who administer leave policies, and Verizon had to post notice of the settlement. The EEOC issued a press release regarding the settlement. At the top of the press release, the EEOC boasted that this was the largest ADA settlement in EEOC history. In the press release, the EEOC stated, this settlement demonstrates the need for employers 
to have attendance policies which take into account the need for paid or unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation for employees with disabilities. Hopefully, this nationwide decree will further public awareness of the importance of engaging in an individualized interactive process to determine whether a disabled employee must be accommodated under the ADA. The message from the EEOC in the Verizon case is that an inflexible attendance policy that did not ever provide for accommodations for employees with disabilities was not to, to be tolerated. Employers can engage in an interactive process once it becomes apparent that an employee has a health issue. An interactive process is a way to communicate between employer and employee to see whether or not an arrangement can be reached in a, spe be reached in a specific case that will be fair to the company and fair to the employee. And the EEOC noted specifically that this flexibility can enable a worker to remain employed. This would be a win for the worker, a win for the employer, and a win for the economy. SuperValue American drug stores and jewel food stores had nearly 1,000 employees between 2003 and 2010 who were terminated at the end of their medical leave instead of being brought back with some form of a reasonable accommodation. 1,000 employees over a period of approximately seven years. This cost these companies $3.2 million in a settlement. And as part of the settlement, the companies were responsible to hire consultants to review current job descriptions and to provide recommendations on possible accommodations for employees with disabilities. They also were required to report on a regular basis to the EEOC. And yes, the EEOC did its press release. And by the way, and press releases are available for employees and customers of companies to read. In this press release, the EEOC noted, it is vital that employers understand that the primary goal of the ADA is to allow people with disabilities to be active and productive members of the workforce. Sending them home with reduced or no pay and without the ability to advance thwarts that purpose. I am concerned that some employers believe that keeping an employee who is able to work off the job and on a leave of absence is a reasonable accommodation, relieving them of further obligations under the ADA. Such a belief could lead to costly mistakes. There are lessons that were learned. First. It is important to engage in that interactive process between the employer and the employee. Make sure that the employees are aware that they do not need to be 100% healed in order to be considered for a return to work. Employees should know that it is possible to find a reasonable accommodation. And job descriptions should not unreasonably limit or restrict an employees with disabilities from meeting requirements for the position. For example, a person whose job it is to type the vast majority of the day should not be required to have to be able to lift 50 pounds. And in a construction company, the receptionist must not have to meet the same physical requirements as the construction worker. There are some practice tips. It's clear that the government's mandate is that employers should get employees back to work quickly if possible. The policy manuals and protocol in the companies need to be flexible so that they can provide for the reasonable accommodation and those policies must be clearly communicated to the employees. Job descriptions must be carefully tailored to the requirements and needs of the position. 
an unduly restrictive job description may make a company exposed to possible claims of discrimination. And be careful when communicating with your employees. Ralph Waldo Emerson is quoted as saying, knowledge comes by eyes always open and working hands, and there is no knowledge that is not power. So in the case of leave and accommodation laws, knowledge is critical. The employee's rights and obligations and the employer's rights and obligations are based on the location where the employee is working. So there are federal laws that will cover the employer-employee relationship, and there are laws that are the laws of the state, and oftentimes laws on a local level in, for example, New York City that govern the employer-employee relationship. The best thing to do is make a list of all the types of leaves that employees in the jurisdiction where the employee works have and what the rights are that go with those types of leaves and make a chart. And that way you will be a step ahead in the event that an issue arises. And this knowledge then becomes the message that needs to be sent both upstairs to the executives and to the managers in the trenches. So the managers are prepared prior to when a request for leave is made. Managers need to know how to respond when an employee approaches them and says, I would like to take leave. One of the concerns that I've experienced over the years is that managers sometimes respond to requests with a knee-jerk reaction. No way. I'm not giving you leave. People in this company have to have two months' notice before they take time off in response to a request for an, by an employee to have surgery because the employee has a tumor and this concern it might be malignant. In another case, yeah, sure, no problem. You can take leave. The next person comes over. No, you cannot take leave. I just granted leave to the first person. And now you expose the company to either a violation of the ADA and possibly a claim for disparate treatment. Another thing that's so important is to strongly encourage the managers and the supervisors to tell those of you in the attendance today who are in HR or counsel, tell you when there is an issue or a potential issue so you know to deal with it. If you don't know about it, you can't fix it. This enables us to have a team that's working very well together, just like the three kids playing baseball in this picture. Um, what we need to do is we need to clearly work together to avoid ignoring or discouraging appropriate requests for leave. That makes employees upset, and employees go to the EEOC when they're upset. Treating employees in a disparate manner, which means that you may face not just an ADA case, but a Title VII case, an ADEA case, ADEA is Age Discrimination Employment Act, and also occasions where the company has a wonderfully drafted policy, but the managers are not properly following it, or they're not following laws. Another concern that does come up quite a bit in this area is privacy. And it's very complicated because on the one hand, there's a strong push to protect private information, such as medical information shared by an employee. So an employee goes to a manager and says, I need leave because I'm having a procedure done. Well, now that manager has been exposed to some private medical information. The manager needs to be taught very clearly and in no uncertain terms to safeguard that private information. If the employee and the manager and HR engage in that interactive process we're talking about to try to find a way to have an accommodation, once again, an employee has been made aware of some sensitive information. And there are steps that can be taken to limit this exposure. One thing is, instead of having the manager be involved in the interactive process, have HR handle the interactive process and remove the manager from, from that process so the manager does not become 
privy to privileged information. And also, when an employee does have an accommodation, obviously people in the company are going to be aware of the accommodation, but they don't have to know more about the person's private medical information. <laughs> Another issue that does arise is employees talk about other reasons why they need to go on leave. For example, an employee may go on leave because she's been physically abused by her significant other. Well, we don't want that to be shared throughout the company. Or maybe she's taken a couple of days off because she had a miscarriage. Once again, we don't want that information shared, if at all possible. Now, I want to talk about a few cases with you. The first one is Grady. And Grady is an example of a situation uh, where an employee made a request for leave so he can have surgery. Walmart granted the request. Four days after the employee went on leave to have the surgery, he got around to telling Walmart, oh, by the way, the surgery was canceled. Well, Walmart was kind of upset with them. They felt he should have told them about the that the procedure had been canceled, and Walmart terminated him. And the court said Walmart was within its right to terminate Grady because he did not notify the company that the procedure was canceled. So you have a happy Walmart in this case. The next case involving Pareda is a very interesting case. She went to work for a company, and before she was there for a year, she announced that she was going to need to take family medical leave for the birth of her child. Now, at the time that she requested the leave, she had not yet been there for a year. When she was going to take the leave, she would have already been there for more than a year. So what do you think the court said? The court said that a pre-eligible employee has a cause of action if an employer terminates her in order to avoid having to accommodate that employee with rightful FMLA leave rights once that employee becomes eligible. And the court found in favor of the employee. So if a person comes to you and says, I am going to need FMLA leave, and the leave will take place after the person has been there for a year, then it's important to grant the leave. The Lee case is a case I think it's hysterical. Um, Lee told her boss in 2008 that she had a medical con condition, and she submitted paperwork for FMLA leave on March 10, 2009. During a meeting on March 20, Lee was told that her employment was being terminated. And Lee asked the HR person at that meeting whether the FMLA leave had anything to do with the decision to terminate her. What do you think HR said in response? You would think they probably would say, oh, no, of course it had nothing to do with it. Not the case. HR said, quote, this company needs reliable and healthy employees. Yeah, reliable and healthy employees. To make matters worse, Lee's boss said that she was upset with Lee because Lee requested the leave without first consulting her and for perceived inadequate notice. It's so important to carefully communicate with your employees about you know, the situations concerning leave. And it can't, I can't overstate that the employees must be told what they can and cannot say when a person requests leave. Because in cases like the leave case, they basically hurt themselves. So how do we approach a request for leave? Automatic denial? No, never. We will never give leave. Of course, that's not the answer. An automatic approval. Yes, every time a person asks for leave, we will grant it. No, that is also not the answer. Let the manager make the decision. After all, the manager knows the employee best and is in the trenches. Not the answer. Let HR make the decision. Well, HR clearly would know best because they know all the employment laws. That's not the answer either. First, have HR and the manager meet to explore 
this particular situation in advance of an interactive meeting with the employee in response to the request. That is the best practice. In the Pfizer case, this illustrates the importance of communicating with employees who are on leave. Rivera Melendez was on military duty when Pfizer decided to restructure his department and several employees had to apply for new positions or risk losing their jobs. The employee was found to have a right to know that he had to apply for a job and that Pfizer should have told him that he needed to apply for a new position. This would apply, by the way, not just in cases of people who are on, on military leave, but also if they're out on leave under FMLA, a workers' comp, a short-term disability, or ADA leave. Make sure that even though an employee is on leave, they're still receiving notice. In the Florida Department of Revenue case, this is a recent reminder of the importance of being careful about retaliation. And in this case, on December 15, the company proposed terminating the employee. On December 20, the employee filed with the EEOC. And on December 30, the employee was fired. Even though the proposal to fire the employee took place prior to the filing with the EEOC, the company was still responsible for retaliation. In the town's case, this is a reminder of another concern. An employee need not say, I want to take family and medical leave. It's enough if the employee says sufficient things to reasonably apprise the employer of the employee's request for time off. One more reminder. Communication after a decision to grant a reasonable accommodation is so important. Several times employers have come to me having made the following mistake. One manager is aware of an employee's accommodation. Another manager is not. The other manager disciplines the employee or rides the employee because the employee is not doing something that typically a person in that position would do. The employee says, hey, I've got an accommodation. And the manager gets upset and the employee files a grievance or a complaint. Please make sure that people are working together so that there is no possible claim of retaliation. And then again, once again, please make sure that all the managers know to keep any medical information they've become privy to confidential. I have some final tips. Remember that more than one law can apply. There might be a federal law that gives an employee one amount of relief, a second law that's either federal or state or local that gives more relief. Both laws, or all three laws, apply. And also keep in mind that laws in one state can be very different than those in another state. I practice in New York and Massachusetts, and I can tell you the difference in the laws is sometimes rather surprising. So please be aware of that. Prepare a list of all possible requests for leave and the rights that go with it, those requests. And make that list known to the managers working in those jurisdictions. Every now and then, make sure to, that your policies are updated and they're current with all applicable laws. And please, and I underscore this, make sure that the supervisors and managers are trained. You know, that's something that I've had on several occasions where one of my clients has come back to me and said, you know, we did a training with you three months ago, and then an issue arose, and you were spot on. I think we probably avoided a major, major catastrophe because of that training. Please just make sure you train and that every supervisor manager is trained at least on an annual basis on leave laws, among other things. And make sure that the part of the training is to mandate that HR be notified immediately of any possible issues. Watch out for possible claims of retaliation, disparate treatment, and one other thing that really is helpful is, whenever possible, conduct audits. Uh, 
see how managers are responding to requests for leave. See what statistical evidence you have that we're not creating an issue of disparate treatment or we're not flexible enough or things along those lines. Thank you for taking the time to attend the webinar today and class is dismissed. Thank you, David. That was very informative and, I must say, rather scary regarding those high payments to the EEOC. And thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. A recording will be available on the Wagner Law Group website. And please feel free to contact David if you have any questions or if you'd like him to train your managers. We hope you'll be back for our next webinar. Thank you very much.